My name is Augustus Norton. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of International Relations and uh, in the Department of Anthropology. And it's been my pleasure for the last 14 years to chair this annual lecture on modern Turkey, which is a pretty unique event. As you know, if you want to study Ottoman history in North America, you'll find many places to go and work. But on the other hand, to focus on modern Turkey is much more difficult. It's as if in many universities, history stopped in the early part of the 20th century when it comes to Turkey. So we've tried to correct that with this uh, particular lecture. I want to say also from the uh, sort of logistical point of view that uh, we have, um, uh, we have a, a full house tonight, and I'm very glad everyone uh, who's here has decided to come. Uh, I want to make sure everybody has a seat that uh, wants one, so I think we're fine. Uh, let me also note that the lecture is uh, being, being, um, um, being taped, and uh, in a week or so, the lecture will be up on the, on, excuse me, on the BU website as well as on the lecture uh, website for those of you who would like to have an uh, encore performance. And also, uh, the WBUR public radio station, which, as you know, is one of the nation's distinguished national public radio, public radio stations, uh, has a program called The World of Ideas, which is on usually Sunday nights. And they are making an audio uh, recording of this uh, event as well. And that will be on WBUR in a few weeks' time. I don't think they've scheduled it yet. Uh, the upshot of that is that uh, for those of you who are asking questions, if you would wait um, until you have a microphone in hand and then uh, perhaps identify yourself if you want to be identified for the world to know, and, uh, and then speak, speak into the microphone. And that way the, the listeners and the viewers will have a sense of what the questions, uh, what the questions are. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, series title. This is the Campania Curvin Lecture Series on Modern Turkey. Um, it's a lecture series which is uh, dedicated to the sharing of ideas from all of the disciplines about modern Turkey. So we've had uh, novelists, uh, entrepreneurs, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, students of architecture, anthropology, uh, journalists and public uh, intellectuals. Uh, the, only, um, the only exclusion from the lecture series um, uh, refers to representatives of governments. So uh, the lecture is more, the lecture series is more than welcome at some point in the future to welcome retired officials and so on, but we don't provide a platform for anybody who's speaking on behalf of any government uh, uh, whatsoever. Now, the namesakes for the lecture are two men, Mehmet Nahid Kurban, uh, who was one of the original Young Turks. This is a man who at one point was the teacher of Ismet Inanu, who of course was one of the major associates of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, one of the founders of the Turkish Republic, um, and was himself, which is to say Mehmet Nahid Kurban, uh, was himself uh, sort of indicative of a sort of new class of, uh, of young professionals. He was an army officer, um, was at home in Paris, in fact wrote his, uh, his master's thesis on an earlier generation of reformers, the young Ottomans, um, and uh, returned to Turkey after the formation of the Republic to play a significant role in the, in the history of Turkey, particularly in the 1920s, 30s, and to the 40s, um, was in the national parliament, served on the board of the National Bank, and so on. Uh, while he was um, in Paris, he met a French woman in uh, about 1910, 1911, married her, I believe, in 1911. Uh, his wife's name was Marguerite. Uh, so this was a man coming from Turkey, but also very sort of intimately connected to France as well. And uh, one, of, uh, one, of his, one of the children of, uh, of, uh, 
of uh, Mehmet Nehad, uh, Nehad Karabin is with us tonight. I'll introduce her in a moment. The other namesake for the lecture is Gerard Campagna, who was born in New Hampshire, was a student uh, of French, in fact, earned his, uh, his graduate degree from Columbia University in French, uh, later came to Boston University, where he wrote his PhD thesis in the Department of History uh, on Turkish foreign policy. Uh, during the uh, Second World War, he was, uh, he was an army officer and uh, was eventually posted in liberated Paris, uh, where he met his bride-to-be, Suzanne, uh, the daughter of Mehmet uh, uh, Nehad uh, Kurban. Uh, they were married in 1945 and, uh, and thereafter moved to Washington, D.C. And I'm proud to say that uh, Madame Campagna is with us tonight. Uh, she's traveled from Washington for the lecture, which she has been very much involved with from its formation, really the sort of uh, inspiration for the lecture series, uh, to be honest. Uh, a very remarkable woman and a friend. A woman who is French, I would say, in her elegance and uh, with a passion for discovery, which is, uh, which is perhaps rather American, uh, but a woman who also has a knowledge that prosperity and modernity is not the particular province of any state, Western or Eastern, but is, uh, is available to all men and women who are willing to sort of make the hard choices and do the hard work that's necessary to give shape to history, as uh, many of the founders of the Turkish Republic uh, certainly did uh, many decades ago. So with a welcome to Mrs. Campagna and to all of you, it's now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for tonight, uh, Mustafa Aykal, who has traveled uh, from Turkey, um, immediately traveling from Washington, but he's based in Turkey. Uh, he's a journalist. Uh, for those of you who follow uh, Turkish politics, you know his blog, The White Pass, which is, uh, which is usually uh, a very sort of interesting place to uh, gain his uh, astute impressions about Turkish politics and developments. Uh, recently, for example, he's followed, among other things, uh, this rather sensational Egenekon uh, uh, trial this has been going on in Istanbul. Perhaps he'll be talking about that tonight. Uh, he's also the opinion editor at the Turkish <coughs> Daily News, which is the oldest English uh, newspaper in Turkey. And he writes frequently for uh, Newsweek, uh, for the Weekly Standard, and other US periodicals. You'll find links to some of his articles on the lecture website. And it's my pleasure to welcome here, him here tonight. Uh, to talk about Turkey. The, the title of his uh, lecture is Yes, We Can. So sort of looking at Turkey today and looking into the future, perhaps with certain inspiration from political personalities who are not particularly Turkish, but certainly have been in Turkey recently. So Mustafa, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Boston University and to turn over the podium to you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mustafa Aykut. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I should thank, first of all, to those people who made this event possible. I had the chance and honor of meeting Mrs. Campagna two days ago in Washington, and I was truly impressed by uh, her story, and uh, I'm very grateful that uh, she, she, she made this event possible. And I should uh, thank Professor Norton and Professor White also for organizing this event, uh, and it's good to be here. And this building is so amazing that I was really impressed when I came and I said, will I be really speaking in this building, which is like out of a, um, like a movie. Um, and well, tonight's topic is Turkey, yes we can, and it is referring to the future of Turkey. Uh, but I believe that to understand the future and the contemporary affairs, uh, you need to know, well, we, you know, but I mean, you need to look at history, especially if you're coming from the old world, where I'm coming from, history makes a lot of uh, sense. It, it explains a lot of things. So in the beginning of the speech, I'll do a little bit of a, of a historical analysis of the dynamics which explain today, uh, it explain today's Turkey, and then we can look uh, towards the future together. Well, to understand Turkey, one needs to 
first of all, look at the Ottoman Empire. I mean, one of the important things which define Turkey, uh, which Turkey struggles with at the same time, but also has taken a lot of things, is the Ottoman Empire. And as you know, the Ottoman Empire was one of the great empires of the world. It survived for almost six centuries. And until its very end, um, the geography that we call the Middle East today was basically the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it had also a foot in the Balkans for a long time, but steadily it you know, went back in the 19th century. The empire start, started to lose land and bits and pieces of the empire started to become independent. The French Revolution, waves of nationalism and you know, different components of the empire gaining their independence. So it's a long story of decline uh, from one perspective. Uh, but also the 19th century of the Ottoman Empire is also not a story, not a story of decline when you look at the idea of modernization, uh, when you look at how modernization unfolded in Ottoman history. Uh, before maybe going to that, I should re re remind that the Ottoman Empire was not a Turkish state. Uh, today, the Turkish Republic is defined as a Turkish state, but the Ottoman Empire was a multi-ethnic and multi-religious uh, entity. Of course, Turks had the upper hand, uh, but they did not even define themselves ethnically as Turks. So the language, the Ottoman language, was Turkish grammar mixed with Arabic and Persian words and written in Arabic script. So it was a, Islam was an important identity, definitely. It was the official identity. But non-Muslim elements of the empire had their own space and they could survive. In fact, the Jews found it much more preferable to Europe and you know, came to the Ottoman Empire, a well-known fact in history. Uh, so this multi-ethnic, multi-religious identity of the empire started to disintegrate, as I said, by, uh, because of modernity, because of nationalism. Because e every component in the empire, one by one, started to say, hey, we are not Ottomans, we are Serbians. We want our Serbian state. We are not Ottomans, we are Bulgarians, we are Greeks. And it went on and on and on. And finally, the empire you know, collapsed, and because of its you know, military defeat in World War I, uh, the Ottomans unfortunately wronged the ch chose the wrong side and allied with themselves with the Germans. Uh, but in, you know, the, the, the, the, that site you know, they, uh, lost the war, and at the end of World War I, the, Ad the Ottoman Empire disintegrated. And what happened was that a new modern republic was created from the ashes, if you will, from, of the empire. Uh, this is, and this is an ambiguous story. It, it, was a modern, it, it was a step towards modernization, the creation of Turkey, the Turkish Republic. Uh, but modernization is al also a painful process, and it also had, it created some dynamics which continue to be problematic uh, to date. Uh, so let me uh, dwell on that a little bit. But oh, actually, before even going to that, I should say one more thing about the Ottoman Empire. I said I refer to the modernization of the Ottoman Empire. This is also important today to understand the dynamics between Islam and modernity. There has been a great deal of discussion of Islam and it's compatible with democracy and freedom and the idea of a modern, you know, secular system, the idea of civil liberties recently in the West and especially in the United States. And there are some skeptical writers who say, oh, Islam is not compatible with democracy because Islam demands that there should be an Islamic state which imposes religion and non-Muslims are by definition second class citizens according to the medieval Islamic understanding of you know, protected people, the Zimmis under Islamic rule. So that, in, in fact, actually, look, if you look at the Ottoman Empire, what you see is that all these traditional Islamic concepts have been reformed in the 19th century. Uh, in the 19th century, with the beginning of the Tanzimat period, uh, 1839, the Ottomans started to adopt Western ways and synthesized them with Islam, or at least made them acceptable to, a, to an Islamic understanding. This started by, of course, adopting science and technology, but over time, the Ottomans started to uh, uh, get Western legal systems and political systems. And for example, that included the idea of equal citizenship. Uh, the Zimmi status, the protected status, which is a protected but somewhat second class status, which was given to non-Muslims in the Islamic age, was abolished by the Ottomans uh, with the Islahat, uh, of, the Islahat decree of 1859, and Jews and Christians were given equal citizenship. 
Uh, actually, the fez, the famous red fez of the Ottoman Empire, was a symbol of this unity among Ottoman citizens because in the past, all faiths would wear a headgear according to their belief, and Muslim headgear would be different from the Jewish headgear, and the Christian one would be different. But the fez came as this modern identity of all Ottomans, which they would wear and which would symbolize them. That's why the Ottoman Empire, again, the, with the same uh, modernization process, established a constitutional monarchy uh, in 1876. And the empire ex accepted a constitution before Russia, Portugal, or Spain. Uh, today, there are some Islamists uh, which say Quran is the constitution. While the Ottomans didn't say that, they st accepted a constitution which respected the Quran. There was a clause about that. But also which limited the sultans of the power, which established uh, liberties for the citizens, which established a parliament in which Jewish and Armenian and other non-Muslim uh, elements of the empire was also represented. So, so when we look at the Ottoman Empire, we should not fall into the mistake of, from my point of view, seeing it as a dark age in which the republic came as a shining sun out of nowhere. I mean, the republic, of course, was a big step forward in Turkey's modernization history, but it also it owed its roots uh, in the Ottoman it owed roots to the Ottoman Empire. And one interesting thing is that while all these reforms were being made in the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman intellectuals were thinking about them and justifying them from, for example, an Islamic point of view. Namuk Kemal, for example, a late Ottoman uh, intellectual, defended democracy from an Islamic point of view. And he said, you know, like the will of God is expressed through the will of people. And, you know, like this, all these, some of the dichotomies between Islam and democracy, which people think that exists today, was actually sorted out uh, by Ottoman intellectuals uh, way back in, in, in late 19th century. So, but anyway, the empire fell. <laughs> and, and the story ended with World War I. And as, as, as I said, after a war of liberation, because even Anatolia was occupied by uh, foreign powers, especially the Greeks. So Turkey fought a war of liberation. And the hero of that war, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, became then the leader of the country, the first uh, president. And the Turkish Republic, as we know today, with its borders, well, there was a few ambiguities in Mosul and, and, and Hatay, but they were sorted out later. But the modern Turkish Republic was created in 1922 and 23, and it became a republic. But here's an interesting thing. A republic doesn't necessarily mean a democracy. Uh, a republic can be democratic or non-democratic. And when the Turkish Republic was founded, actually, in 1923, you could have called it a democracy because there was a parliament which was elected by the representatives uh, of the people from all different parts of the, uh, of the country. And when the republic was founded, soon two political parties emerged. One was the People's Republican Party, headed by Atatürk and İsmet İnönü and the people who you know, sympathized with their uh, political vision. And the other party was, it was just established six months later, this People, People's Republican Party. It was called Terakki Pervar Fırka in Turkish, or Progressive Party. It was created by Kazım Karabekir, which was another war hero. Atatürk was definitely the war hero, but Kazım, Kazım Karabekir was also a general who fought in the East and who was well respected. And there were other uh, uh, like uh, important people in the party. So these two parties started to compete each other, with each other for, for a short time. And when you looked at the programs of the parties, there were some differences. The People's Republican Party, uh, which still survives today, and which has been the like core of Turkish politics, or like the central you know line of Turkish uh, political life uh, um, to date. Uh, I mean, it's an argu arguably. It's referred to this idea of modernization by a revolution and by the state's hand. So the, the, the people had to be modernized. The state should take the action. They were very much inspired by the French Revolution and the French Enlightenment. It was one political view. On the other side, uh, the Progressive Party was more conservative. They believed in modernization, but they believed in a more progressive, evolutionary, not revolutionary, 
modernization. And there was one clause in the uh, founding charter of the uh, Taraki Par Africa, this progressive party. It said, our party is respectful to religious beliefs. And what happened was six months later, in the very beginning of 1925, there was a big Kurdish revolt for, I mean, and I will come to its reasons in a minute. There was a big Kurdish revolt against the Republic and uh, the government, which was at the hands of the People's Republican Party, decided to uh, establish a, an extraordinary law, a martial law, and all political opposition, including this progressive party, was banned. And there was a, so Turkey entered into the single party period, as we call it. And this single party period went from 1925 to 1946, so 20 years of single party period. And of course, the Progressive Party was banned, uh, its leaders, some of them were put in house prison, so because they were seen as enemies of the revolution. And the, in, the, from, in this 20 year period, from 25 to 46, 21 year period, well, uh, Atatürk was the uh, president until 38, and he passed away in 38, and then Ismet Nuri became the president. And Ismet Nuri continued to be the president until 1950. So actually, you can continue this period until 1950, a quarter of a century, from 25 to 50. This is uh, the formative period of the Turkish Republic. And uh, to be honest, it was not a democratic period. Because, because by definition, a revolution and democracy there's a tension between them. I mean, if you are carrying a revolution, if you are saying we are recreating the society based on an ideal, you cannot also look at what society is saying sometimes. You, it was an authoritarian period. Uh, but what happened in this authoritarian period? Well, it was a wave of modernization, to be sure. And some of the things which we appreciate today, like women's rights, uh, or like some of the modern um, styles, like uh, some new laws were adopted, civil codes were, was adopted from uh, uh, Switzerland. So Turkey has been modernized, but this modernization came not from the society itself, but it came from the state. And the thing is, the modernization, this modernization effort was defined quite narrowly, if you will, because it was, all, it was equated by being Western. So modernization and westernization was seen as equal things. Whereas, arguably, you can say, well, we can have a non-Western modernization. Well, the idea didn't exist at the time. Well, it's a, a newer idea. And so, so, so when, when I say modernization, for example, I can understand about building new roads and factories and creating a better economy or something. That's one thing, and it was there. But also, modernization was meant to change the way of life of the society. And, and make the society adopt Western ways of life. And the most iconic uh, example of this attitude of this revolution was the Hatch Revolution of 1925, in which the Ottoman fez was banned, uh, and all traditional headgears were banned, and bowler hats were introduced, and they were the only thing you, you were supposed to wear. And, uh, and for the conservative masses in Anatolia, the bowler hat represented an alien civilization, like the Western civilization, and they didn't want to wear it. So there were like clashes in the country. A few people were executed for not wearing the hat or like standing against or riding against the hat revolution. Uh, and, it, and similar revolutionary efforts continued. In the 30s, for example, for a period, the Turkish music was banned in Turkish radios and only Western operas and you know, Western music could be played because that was the modern way of you know, uh, being. So. And these are some of the excesses. I'm just trying to give you a picture. So when you, so the people who look back at the Kemalist period in today, Turkey, some people say, well, that was necessary because we had to modernize the nation, and it was a, like a basically a peasant society, which had to, which was living in a pre-modern age. So some state enforcement was necessary, and that that's one view. Another view would be to say, well, yes, modernization is a good thing, but the way to modernize is not just to impose a new culture but allow the existing culture to build up itself and in, in focusing on the economy and education aspects uh, and, and allow the society to evolve. And these are two disputed models. And you, know, you, you can choose whatever you want. You can say it was the rightful thing to do or it was not the rightful thing to do, but that's a fact of history. Um, but we should also note that like in that period, uh, like, uh, Atatürk did a lot of reforms and he faced a few challenges when he was like realizing these reforms and or this creating this new society. 
this creating new new nation, the new man, you know, the new Turk out of the Ottoman. Uh, one was one idea was secularism. Secularism meant that religion should be out of public life. It was it was accepted in private life, so everybody had the right to go and pray to a mosque, and you know, private life was fine. But in public life, religion was not was not accepted. So uh, right uh, right one year after the foundation of republic in 1924, in this single party period, Sufi orders were banned. To date, in Turkey, Sufi orders are banned. I mean, they exist. Everybody knows that they exist, but they kind of have to, you know, use euphemistic names and to, you know, uh, to uh, sometimes hide themselves. And there has been political periods which there is a, like a tendency to crack down upon them, or or there's, there are periods which they are safer. So this tradition. So there has always been a tension between the uh, state, the secular state, and the religious groups, um, because. Well, the state simply didn't want the religious groups to exist. And this made the religious groups at least seemingly anti-secular. And then the state said, these are anti-secular. We don't want these forces. And those forces says, well, the state is repressing us. So there's this always continuing tension uh, between the Kemalist state, especially the, the or the uh, ideology, and the religious groups. Another tension, which started again in the 1920s and which still continues to haunt today deeply, is the Kurdish question. Uh, the Kurds were a component of the Ottoman Empire, and until the very end, the Kurds actually supported the empire. Uh, in World War I, in the War of Liberation, 1920s, the Kurds fought with the Turks against the enemy, and the enemy was basically the others, the infidels, I mean, the, the French or Armenians or Russians or Greeks, uh, or in Gallipoli, the French or the British, the other. So the, there were like this Muslim solidarity between Turks and Kurds. Uh, and the don't forget, the Ottoman Empire was not a Turkish state. It was an Ottoman state. Uh, when the Ottoman Empire turned into a Turkish state, uh, and Turkishness became the new emphasized identity, and when Islam lost its preeminence, uh, preeminence as the bond between Turks and Kurds, a new secular identity was introduced, Kurds felt themselves not very, you know, not very well represented in this new order. And that's not a surprise right after the Republic 1923. You have a big Kurdish revolt in 1925. It was an Islamic and Kurdish you know, mixed revolt. I mean, it was a revolt led by a Kurdish sheikh. So, but that revolt was cracked down uh, by the state uh, with strong measures. And then years and years, every year until the 1940s, you had a re Kurdish revolt every year in Turkey. And one of them was in the city of Darsim, which was a tragic event. The revolt was suppressed by warplanes bombing the city and you know there were many civilian casualties so and the name of Darsim was changed into Tunjeli uh, it's like a still a problematic city in Turkey as people who know Turkey would uh, would know so what I'm saying is this the Republic came as a modernization effort and as a also homogenization effort so from the Ottoman identity which was multi-ethnic and multi-religious a new Turkish identity was created, but not everybody was in favor of this new identity. Some people were, some people liked it, and they adopted the new ways and the new system, and some people did not. And the, peop and the segments of society who had a hard time in adopting these, uh, this new way, this new uh, system and new identity, can be basically, a, a big chunk would be conservative Muslims, uh, and the other big part would be Kurds. Uh, but we should also say that the Kurdish reaction has been violent uh, at most times. Like, I mean, it was democratic too, uh, but the, uh, among the Kurds, you had armed rebellions and finally a terrorist organization in the 1980s, the PKK, whereas the Islamic resistance to the system was more on the democratic uh, side. And basically what the conservative Muslims did was to wait for elections and vote for the party which promises more religious freedom which promises to you know, uh, soften the secularism of the state. So this single party period went until 1950, as I said. In 1950, uh, well, in 1946, Turkey changed from single party to multi-party system, and there was a good reason. The Allies won Second World War, and democracy was a new fashion, and you know, Turkey had to adopt, and Turkey adopted. So in 1946, Ismet Irune said that you know, we are accepting this uh, multi-party system, and democratic party, 
the Democrat Party was founded in 1946. And interestingly, this Democrat Party was, in my view, in, in the view of some other scholars, was a, an arguably a continuation of the Progressive Party, which was closed down in 1926. It was, in, in the terms of Turkish politics, a center-right party. It, was, it believed in a less repressive secularism. Uh, it respected, you know, it, it, it, did not, it was not willing to crack down on Sufis and other religious groups. It, it was less, it was more lenient towards Kurdish identity, hence uh, the Democratic Party would some bring some Kurdish notables into the parliament in the 1950s. And it, its emphasis was on economic progress. Whereas the People's Party, the Kemalist emphasis was on cultural progress. Culture being adopting the Western ways of life. Whereas the Democratic Party's emphasis was on new factories, you know, getting the Marshall, uh, you know, uh, plan and, you know, boosting agriculture in Anatolia and building dams and so on. And these two ways of understanding of modernization, in which one, in which one was uh, cultural and the other one was economic, still continues in Turkey. Recently, for example, uh, the CHPs, the People's Republican Party's second man, Onuroy man, criticized the Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan, and he said, well, he might be doing a good job, but he doesn't, he doesn't know how to dance in a ball. You know? Because from the CHP's perspective, that is very important. You should have the right manners, the Western manners, to, be, to act in a social environment, but the AKP, which is, again, a continuation of the center-right, more Anatolian uh, party, which gets votes from the unwashed masses is not that you know, refined in those manners. But they're doing good in economy. I mean, they know how to uh, play with the market. They know how to uh, you know, build and you know, do things. Like they're engineers. They're like, uh, this more, the, the, the tension goes on between the cultural understanding of modernization and the more uh, economic and pragmatic, if you will, uh, understanding of modernization. Anyway, in 1950, what happened? This Democ uh, Democrat Party came to power with a slogan Enough, the nation has the word. Uh, because in the 30s, the CHP had used another slogan, which was very controversial, and it was not very open, but they were using it like uh, jokingly. They said, we are a party for the people in spite of the people. <laughs> because like, the people doesn't have the wisdom to understand that our ways are good. So people need to be re-educated first to understand that our ways are good. So we have to be, act in spite of them, but ultimately we are acting for their benefit. So that was the argument. But in 1950, the Democrat Party came saying, enough, the nation has the word. And it was a big time of economic progress in Turkish history, uh, in the first five years especially. In the latter part of the uh, Democrat Party, the things politically became tense. The Democrat Party itself showed some authoritarian measures about like uh, banning some, you know, censoring the press at times and so on. And the tension increased and increased. And the, an important actor stepped in, which would shape the rest of, you know, Turkish history uh, to date. That's the military. Uh, because, I mean, during the single party period, uh, the state was, the party which was ruling the state was the People's Republican Party. It was the Kemalist Party. So it was based on the revolutionary idea. But when CHP was ousted from power by this democratically elected Democratic Party, which started to shift the policy, uh, someone had to say something. Someone had to save the revolution. Someone had to fight this counter-revolution, as they said. And it turned out that the, it was the military's job. In 1960, the military staged a coup uh, against the Democrat Party. It was only against this party. I mean, the CHP was not close or something. Uh, after uh, like a show trial, to be honest, the prime minister was executed with uh, two of his ministers, and the Democrat Party was banned. And in 1961, new elections take pla took place. The CHP was favored by the system, and CHP was installed again as the you know governing. Five year four years later, a new election happened. The party which continued the Democratic Party, Justice Party, came to power. There was another military coup in 1971. The Justice Party was again thrown out. I mean. And in 1980, the Justice Party was again in power. It was thrown again by the military. So interestingly, all military coups in Turkey have been made against center-right parties in power. Because the center-right somewhat, because of its tendency to be more lenient on religious groups, because of its tendency to not continue the zeal of the revolution, doesn't fit into the you know, uh, standards desired by the military. To be honest, we should also mention that in the 70s, the, sh the 
the discussion also shifted uh, to towards this worry against Marxism because in the late in, in the late 60s and 70s Turkey was also caught with, between this fight between the Marxist groups and the nationalist groups and people were really fearing a Soviet occupation uh, so the the military coup of 1980 also was also linked with this fear from communism uh, so it was a more of a right-wing coup. But again, the party in power, which uh, had, uh, was uh, the Justice Party, which was a centre-right party. So anyway, just to, I want to go, come so, as soon as possible to today, but I should also say one thing. The 1980 coup uh, is also like a new beginning uh, in Turkish political life. For three years, the military regime went on, and tens of thousands of people have been tortured from all walks of life, from all political persuasions, the right things and the left is. Basically, the state wanted to say, I don't want any political uh, nonsense anymore, so everybody should follow the state's line. So all political activists were taken in and tortured and you know, put in prison for years. And especially in the Kurdish areas, the, the suppression and the torture was most severe, and that boosted the PKK, which was a tiny group. The PKK stands for the Kurdistan Workers' Party, but it's a terrorist group terrorists as recognized by the US and EU too. And it is it started as a Kurdish separation movement to fight against the system and create an independent Kurdistan. It, it just minimized its demands right now, but it's still a, a terrorist group. But the PKK's origin, as many experts argue, l are in the uh, in Turkish torture chambers. The people who had that repression in the 80s, early 80s, just went down to join the group and to take revenge. And a guerrilla war started which claims 35,000 uh, casualties up to date, and you know, it's going on. Like, it's, it's, it's lost its impetus, but still people are dying because of PKK attacks. And the anti-PKK war, like the con country insurgency war of the state has been very bloody too, which included burnt villages and some PKK sympathizers, uh, extrajudicial killings and killed by state forces. So there's a, like, a nasty war which went on in Turkey's southeast, but in the 80s, this Kurdish question came back again to the fore uh, because of the PKK's uh, basically presence. And another thing was this, in the 80s, the issue of Islam again came back to the fore. Because when I, uh, the, uh, if you remember, like I said, in the beginning of the Republic, there was a tension between the conservative Islamic groups and the Kurds between this new regime. This died out in a little bit in the Cold War, because in the Cold War, the new dynamic was communist versus you know, the non-communists. But when the Cold War ended and communism in Turkey basically died as a force, the old, you know, rivalries came back, the Kurdish identity again came back, the Islamic identity came back to the fore, and the, and the tensions between these groups and the state again dominated Turkish politics. But again, there was a big difference. The Kurdish opposition, uh, we had the PKK was violent. Uh, there were non-violent Kurdish opposition figures, there are still, but they, were, they remain tiny, so PKK and its political wing dominated the uh, Kurdish opposition. Whereas on the Islamic camp, uh, there was no violence. <coughs> Secondly, uh, well, there was a Turkish Hezbollah in the southeast, but it is a very shady organization, basically created by state forces against the PKK among the religious Kurds, so that's an exception. But uh, other than that, the Islamic opposition, if you will, remained political, democratic, and interestingly, it became grovingly pro-European. It became grovingly pro-liberal, even if you will. And that's the, I think, that's one of the interesting stories that's coming out of Turkey in the past few decades, and I just wanna dwell upon that a little bit. Uh, political Islam is a you know, big debate. You know, everybody's speaking about political Islam these days after September 11, and there are good reasons for it. And we know that there are you know, different there are many different phenomena under this big tent called political Islam, and there are like totally nihilistic terrorist groups like Al Qaeda, which is on the very margins. But there are other, po like, and that's very marginal. And in the mainstream of political Islam, you would have parties like Ikhwan al Muslimin in Egypt, like the Muslim Brotherhood, and their goal would be basically to come to power uh, uh, by democratic means and somehow Islamize the system, like establish some sort of Sharia or bring in some Sharia-based values and use the state in order to you know, create a more Islamic society. That's the basic idea of political Islam. 
uh, this doesn't have to be violent. It is most of the time it is not violent, but it is not liberal either. I mean, it's not you don't create a, a liberal political system by making Islam the doctrine of the state or anything by making anything the doctrine of the state. Um, so in Turkey, do we have such a political Islam? Yes, we had that. We still have that. Now it is, I think, marginal. And that was represented by mainly this political Islam uh, tradition. It arose in the late 60s when the center right was continuously cracked down by the, by the state, by the, uh, by the military. Uh, and, and it's peaked in the 70s and 80s. And finally in the 90s, and it was led, led by Nejmettin Arbakan. He is the, like, the grand old man of you know, Turkish political Islam. And when you look at the rhetoric of Nejmettin Arbakan, He's never violent, but he would, he, he, his party basically, and, and I'm referring to Nejmetin Arbakan and not a party, because he changed five or six parties. Like, because he has, he opens a new party, it's closed down, he opens a new one. The same with the Kurdish case. Like, in Turkey, you have maybe 30 or 40 closed down parties, because these two parties, Islamic or Kurdish, they get closed down, they open a new one, they survive a few years, and the constitutional court closes again, because it's against the regime. That's the, there are like, there are uh, b b boundaries for political parties. So this, Arbakan's political line basically argued that Turkey should have abandoned NATO. Turkey should abandon uh, its European Union dreams. Turkey should create an Islamic NATO, uh, print an Islamic dinar, like a, instead of a Turkish lira. So it was this kind of creating a pan-Islamic new world and Turkey would it be leader. That was Arbakan's dream and goal since uh, from the very beginning. So this is clearly a like a, against the path that Turkey has been taking since the Tanzimat, which is kind of a modernization and adopting Western norms and integrating into the Western world. Uh, but interestingly, this rhetoric did not uh, find support in all Islamic camps in Turkey. Uh, for example, Nurjuz, which is an important Islamic, is, important player in Turkish Islam, it's, they come from Said Nursi, an Islamic preacher who passed, died in 1960. And now represented by other and neo nurju groups like Fethullah Gülen followers, they're like an important, uh, like a player in Turkish society. They never supported Arbakan. They saw him as a troublemaker. They rather supported center right parties like Turgut Özal in the 80s, even before that Süleyman Demirel. And so, because they thought that what we need is not an Islamic grand union of the world or something. What we just need is more religious freedom. And, you know, and the center right can give us that. And you know, we can have this, if the state becomes less repressive, we can have that. So, so political Islam did not appeal to the whole Islamic you know, spectrum in Turkey. And in the late 90s, uh, Arbakan came to power in 1997 with a coalition government. And he really shocked the secular establishment by using provocative, making provocative statements about that a new just order will be founded, which very much sounded like a Sharia-based state. So, if, and the army finally again stepped in. They, they staged what we call the postmodern coup. Uh, in, the, in the modern days, the coups were, you know, how were they? There were tanks on the streets. In the postmodern coup, the army didn't, well, they ran tanks on the street in one instance, but I mean, they did not close down the parliament or arrest people, but they kind of, they worked behind the scenes, manipulating the media and the judiciary to get rid of the government somehow. And the for, finally, the government was forced to resign. So Arbakan adventure died out in 1997 with the postmodern coup. And then the reformist wing in Arbakan's party, which were not very happy with this all, you know, uh, all this nonsense about this new world order. Uh, they they were willing to find a new way, and after some soul searching, they created the AKP, today's you know incumbent party, the Justice and Development Party, in 2001, and in 2002 they became uh, elected, uh, and they re got reelected in 2007 with a very strong uh, majority, like 47 percent majority. T two weeks, three weeks ago, they had a local election. They lost some of their votes. They they they, they fell down to thirty nine percent. That's a local election number, but still, they are now the party that uh, governs Turkey. And I suspect if things go again, like two or three years from now, they might still be the party which will win the elections, the next elections. I mean, Turkey is always unpredictable, but among the players right now, I can, like, 
safely or not very safely assume that you know they might probably win the next elections too, whatever that, that will take place two or three years. So this Justice and Development Party is an interesting phenomenon, uh, and I think uh, it is it's it presents an interesting case and a case study for people who want to study the relationship between Islam and modernity or Islam and uh, politics. To, uh, in the West, AKP is often defined as an Islamist or mildly Islamist political party, uh, and everybody is trying to create you know, some definition. The definition that I would prefer would be post-Islamist uh, political party, because the party is basically coming from Erbakan's line, uh, the prime minister and, uh, and the president right now, who was an AKP member until he was elected president two years ago. Uh, they are basically coming from the line, but they obviously created a big shift uh, in policy. And instead of opposing the West, they actually chose to integrate with the West. Uh, and why? That's a question. And some people say, oh, there's a trick in this. So they will go like this, and one day they will take the swords out because they're Taliban in sheep clothes. And I don't think it's that, it's that way, because I think thanks to Turkey's integration with the global economy, uh, and we, ha we owe a lot to Turgut Özal at that point uh, in the 80s, which opened up Turkish economy and also brought the idea of freedom, religious freedom, freedom of ideas, economic freedom to Turkey. Uh, the Turkish middle class, and especially the conservative masses of Anatolia, who are pious, started to learn more about the world. And they realized that the religious freedom that they have been seeking for a long time can well be achieved uh, in a Western system. For example, many of the wealthy, conservative, pious Turkish families, they had daughters they want to attend to schools. But in Turkey, you cannot wear a headscarf and go to a university. There's a secularism police waiting at the door, which stops you. Uh, they realize that you can, in the US, you can go to a university with a, with a headscarf, or in Europe, or in Britain. So, well, not in France. France is not really the best <laughs> case about this. But the Anglo-Saxon, if you will, the more line, is, which is, more, you know, sympathy for religious freedom. So, and they said, I mean, when you, when we adopt European uh, norms, like we will be able to make these reforms. I mean, the military's role will be just dim diminished. So it will be a more democratic country. We will be able to get the religious freedom we want under a more democratic, like a liberal Western system. So, uh, and also they, you also started to have a, this new Islamic bourgeoisie, as we call it in Turkey right now, which is, like, which has created big business centers in Kaysi, like Anatolian cities like Kayseri or Konya, and they're exporting like blue jeans to 70 countries in the world or something. And this more entrepreneurial uh, class sees its future again with integration with the European Union and not in integration with Iraq or not integration with Saudi Arabia or, you know, uh, or other actors in the Middle East. They have cultural affinity to uh, Muslim countries in the Middle East but they don't exactly be, want to be like them, and they believe in this more global uh, globalization idea. There was recently a report prepared by a Berlin-based think tank uh, titled Islamic Calvinists. It was, it was a study about this Muslim entrepreneurs uh, of Kai City, uh, and it, they said, I mean, the, the phenomenon that we saw in Calvinism way back uh, in the beginning of capitalism, which Max Weber studied brilliantly, and show that religiosity can be a driving force for economic uh, uh, progress is also now seen in Turkish Islam. There are many businessmen who are like uh, creating, uh, like creating new like new businesses. And when they're asked why are you in business, they say, "Oh, Prophet Muhammad was a merchant," like, which he was. So this is different from this is different from seeing Prophet Muhammad as a warrior. Seeing him as a merchant is it because it's a different context and it also gives it a, a more, a more modern, if you will, or more like a trade or you know business oriented Islam, which is of course not interested about waging an Islamic revolution, but interested about the stock market. So I think that base, that social base of the AKP, and AKP gets votes mainly from that you know chunk of Turkish society, Central Anatolian. Uh, um, conservative masses, and also in Istanbul, in you know this new rising, you know, middle Islamic Islamic middle class in Istanbul and Ankara too. That I think base is the reason why Turkey will not become an Iran. Turkey might be becoming a bit more conservative, to be honest, because of this dominance of this new class, which is bringing its own conservative values to the table. 
uh, and the old secular class are basically horrified to see these like women in headscarves in the nice cafes that they only they used to go and now they are there too and it's like a, this class war going on uh, but I don't think I don't agree with the people who think that Turkey is being Islamized to a degree that it is turning its face from the uh, west to the east uh, I'd rather think that Turkey is finally coming to a point in which all the whole segment of the society is becoming a, a, an active uh, an active actor in in making uh, in making policy in policy making or in like legislating like or uh, it is becoming much more democratic uh, the the military's role is being diminished thanks to eu reforms and this whole democratization process and uh, the Kurds are now being represented in the parliament uh, the way that, and they they could even speak kurdish in parliament uh, two months ago which was unthinkable 10 years ago uh, so uh, and probably in the Kurdish uh, section, we will see a dis disarmament of the PKK and a more political uh, argument for whatever the arguments are. I mean, and, and, I mean, there are different ideas in the Kurdish camp, from federation to uh, like a autonomy, from secession, all kinds of ideas. But it's good if they advance it politically. So there is a, probably a chance for that. In the other side, the more conservative masses, which used to be looked down upon by the elite, and which were whose representatives were always cracked down by the military, by a coup, by a soft coup, by a stage coup, or so they are now becoming more active. And Turkish society is becoming a more real society. Now, but is this a good picture? This is a messy picture, to be honest. I mean, Turkey used to be more neat in the past. Like if you go to Istanbul, the type of people you would meet uh, would be like very French, or you know, like. Uh, and if you go to Anatolia, the people will be different, but these two cities will be different. Now they're mixed. You have all sorts of people living in together, and Istanbul is probably the microcosm of this whole country, which everybody has, all the different ide identities are coming up. Now, so is this a brand new Turkey? Um, and by the way, how much time do I have, or should I finish? Okay. Is this a brand new Turkey? And what is going to come out of Turkey in the future? Well, the future is a very long period, but I can comment on the probably t next five to ten years. Uh, the crucial question, actually, for Turkey is the Kurdish question. It is the most lethal question. I mean, the, the debate about Islam and secularism will remain. We will be debating with each other every day whether people can wear headscarves or not. And I, probably th I personally think that everybody can wear a headscarf or a miniskirt or whatever they want. It's their choice, not the state's. Uh, job to define that uh, but that will go on but that's a kind of a tension which can be managed within democratic uh, system but the Kurdish question has the potential to turn into an ethnic conflict I don't still want, find it very likely but it says the potential to turn into a like an ethnic conflict because the PKK which is seen as a terrorist organization and hated by the 90% of the Turkish society, when you go to the Arbukur, I was in the Arbukur during the election results like three weeks ago, and it's a, it's a predominant Kurdish city in the southeast, and PK, the people were marching saying that we are PKK, we are the people. So there is this popular base, and Turkey has no way of fighting terrorism uh, only with guns. I mean, that's a lesson that Israel should learn too, and maybe the US too, I mean, at least the previous administration. But if if the people that you call terrorists are not just a few hundred nihilists who are fighting crazily and if you if they are rooted in a people if they have popular support uh, you still have to use military means to protect yourself but the only way to deal with such kind of terrorism is to uh, reach a political settlement and so turkey uh, turkey's biggest issue will be to this political uh, deal the, the political settlement the Kurdish issue and the uh, nationalist Kurds which make probably five percent of the population have demands like an autonomy or federational Turkey uh, they have the demand that their leader Abdullah Öcalan will be released from prison which I don't think which is going to happen uh, uh, but you know there, there are very strong demands on that side and how to reconcile these demands and how to come to terms with them is important because on the other side you have a very strong Turkish nationalism which is not looking at, it, at these issues any uh, sympathetic in any way and which uh, again brings me to my last point which is this another 
uh, threat to Turkey today, which is actually the mirror image of the Kurdish issue, is Turkish nationalism. Because we are seeing the rise of Turkish nationalism uh, since the beginning of the 2000s, interestingly, as a reaction against EU uh, reforms. Uh, and today, some people are speaking about the rise of Islam in Turkey. I don't see that as a danger. I see nationalism as a danger. Because nationalism has turned into a force which opposes anything which is new, which opposes any liberal uh, reforms. And interestingly, some nationalists do this in the name of Ataturk. Uh, because, to be honest, what, when you look at the Kemalist period in the 1920s and 30s, for me, Atatürk was a modernizer, and he did the best of his time. Like he did, he looked at the world, he chose the best models, he tried everything he could. For a time, he tried liberal economy, it failed, he tried you know, state-managed economy and so on. What happened was that after Atatürk, and even when he was alive, people turned his policies into dogmatic principles. Like statism is a Kemalist principle in Turkey. Statism means that this, the state should run the economy. Now, that made sense in the 1930s when the Soviet Union was making great success with five-year plans and, you know, the you know, U.S. economy was going down, New Deal, and, you know, all those years. But, you know, statism, a state-run factories, and that doesn't make sense in Turkey. But still, that is defended as a principle of Atatürk. So I think if we understand Atatürk in a more historical sense, not in a literalist sense, and, t and look at him as a genius which did the best for his time, but now we have to move on and maybe change some of the things he did in the 20s. I think Turkey will be uh, much more successful in, you know, in its uh, adoption of uh, the freedom that it really needs. And you ask about Ergenekon, so let me finally come to that. Um, Ergenekon is an interesting case which is going in the past two years. And it's been two years that the case started. It's, it's the, probably the most interesting case, uh, legal case in Turkish history. Uh, Arge the term Argenekon is a Turkish myth. Uh, the, the, it's, it's a total mythology, but once, uh, once upon a time, the Turks were being ex exterminated by the Chinese. There was one Turk left, and he went into a cave, and he had some relation with a wolf, and they had children. And that, those wolfy Turks became the real Turks, and they opened up the mountains and came out. This is kind of a totally mythical, you know, <laughs> which can't be biologically true at all. <laughs> It is like only if you're a really diehard Turkish nationalist, you would have some you know, feeling for the term Argenekon. But what happened was that when I think, apparently in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s especially, a group, of, a group started to form between some hot-headed generals which thought that the current government, the AKP, is selling Turkey to Europeans because it was giving concessions in Cyprus. Uh, and also making other, accepting other liberal reforms and you know, being too pro-Kurdish and so on. And on the other hand, uh, some, ideal, some nationalist ideologues kind of forming an alliance and first trying to stage a military coup in the military. Like some generals apparently lobbied in 2003 and 2004 to launch a military coup against the AKP, uh, but there were dis disagreements with the, between the generals. And one interestingly said, how can you make a coup with this media? Like there are 50 TV channels every day. Like, I mean, which one will you control? Because the last military coup in 1980, there was only one TV channel and you control that and you control everything. Like in this day and age, they said, how can you make a coup? So finally the military decided not to stage a coup because it was not you know, really possible and the stock market would fall down next day and how do they, what do they do about it? But the more radical generals among that camp, then actually they were pushed away from the military, they resigned. After resigning, they formed this crazy nationalist you know, cadre in order to force the military to stage a coup. By how? By provocations, by bombing a secular newspaper, by shooting a secular judge, so that the secularists will be alarmed that the Islamists are coming, and so we have to take something. So that is the uh, Argenekon uh, case which is going on. Some people criticize the case as the AKP's opportunity to crack down its political opponents and I'm not sure whether there's an element of that. There might be, uh, to a degree. Some innocent people might have been arrested. But still, many uh, people I trust, like the more liberal commentators, think that this is a very important case. Because for the first time, the people, like generals, are being on trial, are like tried for staging a military coup. Like this is, because all the generals who stage military coups, 
They became presidents, they became lifetime senators, and they're living in wonderful places right now. It is not a crime in Turkey to save a military coup. You're saving the country. That's the idea. So it's the first time that Turkey is facing the fact that the people who claim to be patri patriots, and who can be actually patriots, can be also criminals. Because, I mean, you can love your country, but you can still do very bad things. I mean, all the fascists basically love their countries, but they also do terrible things to its people. Uh, so in that case, I think the case is important. Uh, it should be careful. So not sometimes, I mean, a lot of people are uh, under investigation or, you know, uh, and these include prominent some of the university rectors and so on. And some of them might be innocent, and I hope that they will be to released as soon as possible and they will be cleansed from the charges. But I think it is an important case. And I think, yes, it gives us hope for a brave new Turkey. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very insightful and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and very important overview Thanks so much, of, of recent Turkish history as well as the Ottoman background. We're going to take some time for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand and we'll get you a microphone. And uh, while people are formulating their questions, let me ask, if I may, uh, of your impression of uh, President Obama's recent trip to Istanbul and how that played, if you will, among, uh, among many Turks. Okay, sure. First of all, I should say I'm a fan of President Obama. I canvassed for him in Virginia before he was elected, like personally. So I was very happy that the night that he was elected because I believe that U.S. needs a more dialogue-based you know, foreign policy, not you know, like a war-mongering-based war foreign policy. Uh, and... And I think his trip to Turkey has been very successful. The messages I think he gave in the Turkish parliament were brilliant. Um, he interestingly used a term, which I appreciated a lot. He used the term secular democracy. He said Turkey is a secular democracy. This is a brilliant term. You can say what is the big deal about secular democracy. In Turkey, they, it's often used secular republic. We speak about a secular republic. And democracy is seen as an alternative to the secular republic. There has been people who openly said that I'm in favor of the secular republic, I'm not in favor of democracy. Well, w what is good in a secular republic if it is not democratic? Like, I mean, it can be authoritarian and secular and, you know. So this, we should understand secular, I don't say secularism, I say secularity. We should understand secularity as a principle for freedom, not against freedom. A principle which saves sta the state from, you know, from a religious, the dominance of religious doctrine, but it, which also doesn't suppress religion. So I think his uh, terminology was brilliant. On other issues, he referred to the, his own views about the Armenian tragedy of 1915. And he said, he was, I think, very honest. He said, you know what I think about this, but I came here to learn about your views. And I think that was also brilliant. And he also referred to this uh, ongoing rapprochement between Turkey and Armenia which is, again, I think something uh, influ uh, valuable and which should not be interrupted by a kind of a statement coming from the U.S., which will only provoke Turkish nationalists in Turkey. Uh, the things he said about Islam, he said the U.S. is not at war with Islam, and he said, I'm a Muslim, I have a Muslim in my family. Too. He said that there are many Americans who appreciate as, uh, Muslims because they have Muslims in their families. He said, I'm one of them, and that was a big applause in the Turkish parliament. So it was... Very, very good, and it was very well received. The only people who kind of criticized him were the MHP, the Nationalist Action Party, the Nationalists, because of what he said on the uh, Armenian issue. But you know, you cannot please anybody, and it's very hard to please the Nationalists in Turkey. So I'm not surprised by that. Um. Uh, my name is Matt Tekin. I'm, uh, I'm a graduate student here at BU at the International Relations Department. Is this working? It's only working for us. It's not working. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you, you, mentioned, uh, you said that there's no Islamization uh, in Turkey and no rise of Islam. How do you explain um, recent events like people uh, getting beaten up uh, for drinking alcohol? Uh, a couple of days ago, I... Uh, uh, a young man was shot because he was kissing his girlfriend. And obtaining alcohol license for restaurants is extremely difficult. They uh, uh, impose taxes. They, uh, the government imposes taxes on alcohol. And uh, the uh, 
the so-called micro-fascism. I mean, not a state-led uh, oppression, but uh, micro, like at the, uh, the Mahalla Baskese. We have uh, a good pressure, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, can I ask another question? Sure. Um, and you said that the uh, AKP is doing good uh, with the economy, uh, but the last time I checked, the uh, unemployment level was about 12%. And um, do you really believe that the economy, Turkish economy, is doing good? And on what basis do you uh, yeah. say that? Well, the last time I checked, there was a you know, global economic crisis, too. But good point. Uh, and well, thanks for your questions. Around that, uh, around that level since, since AKP came to power. Yes, unemployment is a problem. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. These are important questions. First, come, let, me back, come, let me go back to your first questions. The, this neighborhood pressure in Turkey, which is discussed a lot, it's a big issue. And the idea is that... With the AKP in power, uh, and some of the municipalities taken over by the more AKP-minded people, they, their conservatism, moral conservatism, their lifestyle is being imposed. They don't allow new restaurants, for example, in some municipalities to open, you know, uh, to get a license for alcohol, or they don't, like they, in some conservative towns in Anatolia, uh, some streets, some areas were like declared as non-alcoholic area, so you can have alcohol only one part of the town and not the other part of the town. Well, I'm not a fan of that, but again, if you look at dry zones in like Bible Belt in the US, you can see that this is not, maybe it's not something we would cheer for, but it, it exists, it happens. And uh, actually it's the same, it's with the same dynamic that's happening. In, uh, I looked at the dry zones in the US and it's the local council there which votes and decides to declare one zone a dry zone because they say we don't want our kids to see people drinking and so on. Uh, it's not, I mean, my, again, I, I don't, I would not vote for if I was in a council for a banning of alcohol. But in the same thing is happening in, uh, in, for example, in some areas in Anatolia, the council basically say they don't want to give, a, uh, like, permission to drink alcohol. They say, oh, there's a school which is not too far from that. We don't want our kids to see that. So this is happening, yes. Uh, as for the beatings, and I mean, I don't think AKP orders people to you know, beat people, but uh, that's tragic, of course. Anybody who's beaten or you know, kind of harassed for being not observant, that is horrible. Uh, I don't think there's a policy behind it. And actually, when you look at those things in Turkey, you often will realize that they're coming from the nationalists, the MHP uh, sort of militants. Uh, because, for example, they beat up men who has long hair too, which is not an Islamic thing, or they beat up people who speak Kurdish as well in, in Central Anatolia. And there was a recently a report about this, uh, conservatism in Central Anatolia by Binas Toprak, and the title was looking suspiciously at the other. I mean, being different. Oh, the title was being different. So being different by drinking whiskey or having a long hair or by not speaking Turkish and speaking Kurdish. Well, Islamically, there's no problem with speaking Kurdish. I mean, what I'm saying is that there is a conservatism which is disturbing, but it is not coming from a Sharia court or something. It is just this, to be honest, narrow-mindedness uh, being expressed. And can AKP's dominance in politics be accelerating these things? I think, yes, there might be a connection there. But I don't, again, see this as a plot to Islamize Turkey. I see this as a, um, like a, I see this actually a social fact which is coming to the surface that we have to deal with and speak about. Another thing is this, there is neighborhood pressure in secular areas as well. Like I used to work for Hurriyet Daily News, well I still work but I don't go to the office anymore, but like it's a, it is Turkey's biggest media empire, like 3,000 people are working there. There is not a one lady with a headscarf. There are a few ones, but they are the cleaning ladies. And if you're a cleaning lady, you can wear a headscarf. That's the thing. Uh, but you, as a normal employee, you cannot. Or like in other neighborhoods, like in fancy secular upper class neighborhoods, in Shantashi, Bebek zone, if you are wearing a headscarf and you're walking, people look, at, look down upon you. I've seen people who calling themselves cockroaches because of what they wear. So I say there is neighborhood pressure in Turkey everywhere, unfortunately, and none of the neighborhoods, whether they can be secular or conservative, are as liberal or as, are as open-minded as I would love to see, and some of them are very rigid. So the question boils down to tolerance, tolerance to difference, tolerance to pluralism. 
And I think, yes, we, Turk, we Turks need to work on that a lot. Uh, but it is not just one, it's not only on one side, it's on both sides. Sorry. How about Oh, sorry. Well, I think there's a consensus in Turkey that the AKP has been successful, at least in its initial years, on the economy. And yes, unemployment has not gone down very much. And in the past few, in the past two years, sorry, because of the political turmoil, they just lost their focus on the economy. And yes, they are now being criticized and they lost votes. But the thing is this, there is no other political party in Turkey that you would vote for if you are economically minded. Yes, AKP is not doing great these days, thanks because of the crisis and because of the prime minister's own, you know, uh, sometimes anger and creating a lot of turmoil in political uh, in society. But if I'm a totally business-minded person, who I'm gonna go, gonna vote for in Turkey? I don't see any alternative because none of the other other political parties are really focused on the economy. Uh, CHP is focused on well, CHP is trying to change now but they had been focused on the headscarf and banning the headscarf uh, for years. And MHP is uh, focused on banning Kurdish as much as it can. Uh, and AKP still seems to be the, relatively speaking, the most economically pragmatic uh, party. I hope there will be a better one, you know. Thank you. You're um, is, there any, is there any possibility to create positive peace between Turkish state and government and PKK? What I mean by positive, positive peace is um, building peace through democratic and peaceful means, not by military solution, military oppressions. Well, that's something that most of us have been arguing way back uh, since the 90s. I mean, I don't think that the Turkish state will ever sit down with PKK's militants, you know, guerrilla leaders in a table, and I don't think that's a good thing to do. Uh, but PKK has a political wing, uh, always in the party, which is banned in every few years, but open, opens up again with a different name. And I think that's a chance for Turkey to uh, utilize. Now that, interestingly, that political wing is in the constitutional court and there's a closure case against that political wing, the Democratic Society Party. Uh, I rather think that, like Turkey is now speaking to the uh, uh, leaders of Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, Barzani and you know other uh, officials there, Turkey should be able to speak to the leaders of its own Kurdish movement. Well, the big leader is in prison, as you know, Abdullah Jalan, and I think he will remain in prison, and I don't think that there's any chance and they sh he shouldn't be out. But maybe some, um, even it's possible to cut a deal with him while he was in prison, and also uh, use the DTP, the Democratic Society Party, as a channel to the guerrillas in the mountain, and also use the US and the Iraqi Kurdish authorities. And, and now it is happening. I mean, what I'm saying is happening, and there's like, probably a work going on and we might see that happening. But that is the wish of many people in Turkey to find a political solution because the, one of our generals once said, we will kill all those terrorists until they're all finished. And they have killed 25,000 of them. Why they never finish? Because if you kill somebody, his nephew comes and takes the revenge. And this is, I think, a lesson that all governments who are fighting terrorism should understand. Thank you, Mustafa, for a um, really enlightening and excellent talk. Um, I wonder if I could go back to the issue of nationalism. Um, we taught you talked about the Ergenikon type nationalism, the sort of state produced nationalism. But I wonder what's the relationship between the pious conservative population and nationalism? What kind of nationalism do you see there, uh, including attitudes toward the Kurdish situation, towards joining the EU? I mean, it's not just the AKP, but the population as a whole, which is a large part of Turkey. And I just wanted to add that this morning, you probably know this on the news, that they arrested a large number of members of the Kurdish political party for being pro-PKK. So, so much for using that as a conduit for peace. Yeah. Well, um, that's a good question. Thanks so much, Jenny. And uh, yeah, nationalism is not only found among the literally nationalists. I mean, there's a Nationalist Action Party, which gets 30, 15 percent of the votes. They are the like leading uh, group. There's another one called the Grand Union Party, whose leader just died. It was getting 2%, something like that. Uh, but you can find nationalism everywhere. Like, AKP's base is, to a degree, yes, nationalists too. Uh, I remember, like, a there was a film being 
a documentary film was shot being shot in Kai City, and it was a medieval castle. Because if it was a medieval, they put a cross on it like as a crusader cross, and then people came take down that crusader cross. We don't want to see it, and they try to explain this is a film. They said whatever it is, we don't want to see that kind of thing. So this yes, there is this naive, to be honest, a little bit narrow minded, uh, opposition to the foreigner. But despite all that, AKP has been able to sell the EU to its constituency. I mean, it's, it's surprising that they have been able to uh, persuade its own supporters, which is like 40% of the population, to accept concessions in Cyprus, to accept uh, European Union reforms, to accept you know, liberal reforms on the Kurdish question too. Uh, so I think you should find ways to appeal to the uh, conservative a big chunk of Turkish society, this whole center-right voting. And here's one catch. Uh, some people say to me, liberals are the best hope for Turkey. And I agree. But liberals get, when they go into election, they get 0.5% of the votes. Like, there has been a liberal party in the mid-90s, it just failed. Because liberalism, it, in its own foreign language, doesn't go to Anatolia. But what happened was that if center-right conservative political forces adopt liberal views and sell it to their audience, it makes sense. Turgut Özal did that in the 80s. And Turgut Özal himself was a religious man. He was coming from a Sufi background. He was pious. He was praying. and uh, But he was also very well versed in the economy in the first place, global economy. And he was he believed in the idea of freedom. And he said three freedoms are the, what we need. Freedom of uh, ideas, freedom of religion, and freedom of entrepreneurship. So. He brought this freedom agenda to the conservative masses by using their language. And I think AKP has been able to do that to a degree. And let's not forget that, after all, AKP is Turkish, too. So like, whatever you problem you find in that party, this political party, the deep-seated problems like corruption or tendency towards one-man show and leader-dominated politics, you find it in AKP as well. And sometimes their nationalism side comes up, too. And there are different members of AKP. Cemil Çiçek is more nationalist whereas you have also more liberal wing in the party. So these are just always playing factors. But yes, uh, nationalism is a force, tr trouble force, which means that it should not be provoked by foreign powers. <laughs> and one thing is, sorry, nationalism also erupted when the EU started to act towards Turkey in a very condescending and looking down upon way. I mean, e EU said we will accept you, and they said, oh, we won't want to Turks. Like, the French and the German attitude just empowers nationalism. They say, if the EU, EU doesn't want us, we don't want them any at all. So let's just go back to our old ways. So uh, that's why I think uh, Obama might be the new channel, the new hope that Turkey might be clinging in the West. He's much nicer than Sarkozy and Merkel. I have the microphone here. Um, Darren Ergenc, uh, PhD student at the Political Science Department here. Um, I would like to ask you about the, um, the legislation, the laws that uh, AKP has passed since uh, it has the overwhelming majority in the parliament. Um, and my starting point is that you described the, the current situation as the society is taking over politics in Turkey and vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the paternalistic Kemalist state and voicing, I mean, vo the society has gained its voice, right? And um, first, I, I'm sure you'll uh, agree with me if we define uh, society in non-monolithic terms. The society in Turkey who has gained voice um, is not only middle-class, conservative, Turkish, Islamic, Central Anatolian society, right? There are different segments and classes and groups in the society. And I was wondering what uh, AKP has done in legal terms to guarantee the channels of um, voicing their interests and concerns for all segments of the society. Um, let's take the workers, for example. Um, are the workers, the working class, is able to is it able to voice its concerns? Um, because you know the um, the May first demonstrations last year had the harshest 
uh, breakdowns since '94, since Chiller's time, right? And like the the, the workers in um, in in Tuzla, in the docks of Tuzla, for example, are they able to unionize? Uh, are there rights of uh, uni uh, unionizing uh, protected by AKP um, or the administrative lit litigation law, for example? the administrative litigation law, the, the right to uh, the state compensation system, for example. Did AKP do anything about that other than, you know, uh, the policies? Because policies come and go, right? And, and they change, say, for example, before the local elections and after the local elections. And the, the minorities, for example, the, the non-Muslim minorities, are they a rise protected? by the law now? I mean, are there any legislation passed for that? There are, of course, policies here and there. Uh, the, the voice, like the, the, the, the New York State Channel, for example, for Kurds. But are there any substantial steps that has been achieved in the last couple of years? Thank you. I want to ask. Question. And, the, and the, the last example is the, the, the social security reform, for example, which is now family-based, but it. not do you support? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, do you think that this family-based social security reform would protect the rights of individuals who don't identify themselves with the, with a family, or like the immigrant workers in Istanbul who don't have a family? I wasn't focused on the family-based nature of the thing, but I was. Well, your question, I think, presumes that a welfare state is a good thing, and I think that's a debatable, like, presupposition. Uh, like AKP is a center-right political party, and yes, it is not. Its main asset is not worker rights. It's it's not about. It doesn't believe in the welfare state. It rather believes in a more limited government and more charity-based social networks. And this debate is going on in the U.S. for a while too. I mean, you can look at the Republican Party. You can look at the d Democrats, and there are differences. And I, AKP would be on the side of uh, Republicans in that sense. If you look at their more, I mean, they, the way they understand the economy and the state's role and the role of uh, faith-based initiatives. AKP, AKP believes in faith-based initiatives and wants to open that channel. And uh, so, th I mean, that's a preference. I mean, I, you might find it as a bad thing. I'm not necessarily against that. I'm more, uh, I believe that society should be able to take care of its own um, as much as possible, take care of its own like charity needs or its, so, its uh, solidarity, because I, don't th I believe that there are problems with the welfare state systems too, which creates like laziness and, uh, I mean, all the arguments, you know, these are big, this is a big debate. So, I mean, AKP is on the right side of that debate, that's obvious. Uh, and you, if you ask what they have done about laws, actually they have done a lot of things. And maybe they wouldn't do it that good because, but thanks to the EU and the EU norms, which they accepted, they have done a lot of things. One big issue was the women's rights issue. In 2004, they adopted a new, almost a new legal code, which gave women full equality in family. In the past, in Turkish like law, it was written that a man is the you know, chief of the family. It's not that way anymore. Or w women gained their sexual autonomy, which means that in the past, a rape in the family would not be much of a, would not be considered as a crime. Now it is a crime. If a husband you know, rapes a, a woman, and there is no difference between someone else doing it and, and the husband doing it. It's, it's a rape, it's a crime. So they really improved the uh, position of women and it was cheered by, you know, female organizations too. Um, and you ask, oh, Christian minorities, actually the non-Muslim minorities are doing much better than they used to. Again, thanks to EU reforms, but AKP accepted those reforms. For example, the Protestants would not be, would not have any chance to uh, gather, like, and have a, like a sanctuary, have a worship place in the past. Because the Turkish state used to say, well, we know only three Christian communities. We accepted it in Lausanne, the Greeks, the Armenians, and the... Uh, well, the Greeks, Armenians, Catholics, yeah, basically. I mean, Protestants were not accepted because it did not write in the Lausanne Treaty of 1922. But, I mean, they exist. I mean, they are, I mean, they are new Protestants. What are you going to do? I mean, Turkey has this, Turkish state has this tradition of looking at the law and say, you are not written in the law, so you don't exist. Well, that person exists. So, for example, now uh, the Protestants have a new legal status and they have this unification churches and, all, and they created a new legal status for their churches. Uh, are there problems? Yes, but they are much better than they used to be. Uh, it's a, and it was not an accident that many Armenians voted for AKP in 2007 
they found it to be the least nationalist and uh, most uh, you know, uh, progressive party. The Jews are not in that way because they're rightfully disturbed about some of the you know, anti-Semitic uh, language uh, in the Islamic camp they can see sometimes, and they might be linking to the AKP. But we should also not forget that the anti-Semitism, for example, exists in the secular camp as well. The best-selling book in 2007 in Turkey was a book which argued that the Prime Minister Erdogan, the Islamic Erdogan, was actually a secret Jew working with Mossad to create, to destroy Ataturk's Republic. And, and the cover was like a Tsar of David Erdogan's head was in it and it was his headscarf wife. So like craziness exists all around in, in different camps. And like, I'm not a proponent of AKP, like I, mean, there are many, I can start to criticize them and I can go for hours, but relative, to be honest, I voted for them and I might vote for them again unless there's a better party because I think they're relatively doing good when compared to other parties. As for worker rights, I don't know. Like that's another debate. I, I I believe that workers have rights, but you know how to balance that with the idea of states interfering in society, and that's a debate. One final question. Hi, uh, I have a question about the oper Ergenek operation that you have mentioned. You have mentioned that some innocent people have been could have might been have been because yeah arrested, but. Do you really see no links between uh, the politics going on in AKP and the Ergenekon operation? Because some people like Sabih Kanadolu have been arrested who had very sharp actually uh, explanations about when uh, AKP's headscarf issue was going on and their trial about closure was going on. One year later they are taken under custody. Mm -hmm. Don't you really see no links? Like Well, I see a very clear link. Ergenekon is a network which was basically trying to create a military coup against the AKP. I mean, I have no objections to that. So, I mean, it is very, exp I mean, whom would be, a, I mean, the, the plot is, as, the, as there are quite many evidences like, that there is this idea that the AKP is taking country away from its rightful Kamalist basis and selling it to the Europeans and giving concessions in Cyprus and not nationalist enough and selling it to the Kurds. So this is like a traitor party. So the people who are against the AKP, it is a very rightful thing to be against AKP, but the Ergenekon indictment says the political opponents of the party also, some of them, some generals, some, some intellectuals, they formed a kind of a network in order to stir up a coup first in the military and they could not do it and then they tried to other means to you know provoke the country and stir up the country and provoke a coup. So if that is the allegation, it is, of course, very natural that the political opponents of AKP would be the people who would be arrested. But not all political opponents. There are many zillions of political opponents of AKP. I mean, there are columnists who swear AKP every day, and that's fine, and they're still there. They're not arrested, but some people are arrested. And, of course, an ideological connection is not a crime. But if they have been beyond an ideological connection, there was also like an organizational connection. They knew that, oh, a bombing would be good so that they will provoke the military to, if they knew that and they were in this kind of thing. And there were been many evidences for this, like documents, you know, tape recordings and phone conversations and, you know, they were like uh, released. Uh, that is a serious thing. And I'm not a judge. And I said, I hope if there are innocent people, I'm sure some people might be innocent because like they take a lot of people. If they're innocent, I hope they will be cleared up soon. And uh, But I also see that this is an important thing. And it's not just AKP. For example, the people who killed Kurdish dissidents in the 90s are now in tri on trial. We uncovered uh, killing fields in Turkey, like acid wells. Some, some people were thrown in acid. Uh, these are Kurdish intellectuals who sympathize with the PKK. The basically state had a license to kill everybody who was pro-PKK in the 90s. And, 10,000 10, people already has been killed. So some of the colonels and other generals who were responsible those, for those things, as everybody knew in the region, are now on trial. So it's not just AKP2, it goes way back to this you know, counterinsurgency campaign too. So this is serious. Can some people be you know, unrightfully arrested? Yes, I hope you know, that won't... I mean, and it's not my job. It's the you know, job of the judges to decide that. The judiciary has been acting independently of the politics of the AKP or any other party when this trial has been or the operation has been going on. 
Well, I think judiciary in Turkey generally has acted against the AKP. If you look at if you look at the constitutional court, uh, this, well, the constitutional court was already closing down the AKP, and you know they also punished it for being an anti-secular force, uh, which, to my mind, is a totally uh, unjustified verdict. I mean, the AKP was tried in the constitutional court for being an anti-secular force, and the only thing they did was try to allow the headscarf in the campus. That was their biggest heresy against, against, according to Turkey's official secularism. And the constitutional court, that they decided this is an anti-secular party, but we are not closing it, but we are punishing it, giving them a big fine, so we will be watching them and so on. And I think this is insane, to be honest. Like, in democracies, such things don't happen. Uh, the judiciary has not been a fan of AKP at all. I mean, in, in, in fact, the judiciary in Turkey has been much more on the Kemalist uh, line of politics, more of the pro-CHP line of politics. This prosecutor, if you can say, maybe is not that kind of person, and he's more on the maybe, I don't know the prosecutor's political views, maybe he's not ideologically on that side, but it is, I think, it is, it won't be very justifiable to regard the uh, judiciary on the side of the AKP. I think it's the other way around. The judiciary, the Constitution Court annulled privatization decisions by the government. They said privatizations against other Turks' principle of statism. But we had companies which were just losing money every day, state companies. I mean, we couldn't privatize them because Atatürk opened them in the 1930s. So, I mean, that's the kind of judiciary, the general judiciary we have. Stop, I want to uh, thank you very much for delivering the 2009 Campania Kerbin Lecture at Boston University. Thank You're you, provocative, sir. Uh, incredibly far-ranging and informed. And Thanks I want to so thank much. you it's very, very much for making the journey to Boston. Please join me in thanking Mustafa. Thank you.